Welcome to the Tech Support Guy Show, episode 36, recorded on Sunday, August 15th. Wave bye-bye. Welcome to the Tech Support Guy Show. I am Mike Cermak. What are you doing, Brian? You throw me off I'm already. Just making sure my video is not frozen. <laughs> and Brian Hansen is in San Francisco, and his video is not frozen. <laughs> my video is not frozen. Good morning. So, how are things in San Francisco today? Gloomy, cold. That's not kind right. of kind of drizzly. Yeah, it, it's exactly what su- summer is supposed to be in San Francisco. Actually, <laughs> might as well not even be in San Francisco. Be a heck of a lot cheaper to be pretty much anywhere else. <laughs> well, I'm but. glad you could be here with me today so that uh, we can go over a couple of the tech news. Uh, we go over a couple of stories. A lot of them are mentioned on the tech news section of the website, techguy.org. So if you have any suggestions for news, post them up there uh, and uh, feel free to go there to be able to discuss it. So let's jump right in, Brian. I have um, a couple of interesting articles here. First of all, I want to get out of the way. There's a couple of browser updates coming down. Uh, Microsoft has announced that IE9, Internet Explorer 9, beta is going to be released next month. And you hear nothing but crickets. <laughs> Who cares? Everyone's so excited. Well, you got to realize most people you know, still do use Internet Explorer. For whatever, well, I know what reason because that's what it comes on their computer with. Uh huh. So I don't know. Uh huh. And is anyone going to really install the update? I don't know. Apparently, it's much faster than the previous versions, which really doesn't say much. Uh, it runs HTML5 native. Um, I I don't know. It's it's the next big revision. Okay. What's big about it? What's big about it? Mike? Uh, What's big about the this controversy? Anything? I will tell you is that it only supports Vista and Seven. You can't use it in Windows XP. You can't. Oh, great. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> or previous That's versions, good. you know, obviously. But a lot of hardcore XP people are not pleased that Microsoft is doing this when they supposedly are still under the support period for XP. Right. But of course they are. That doesn't mean that they're going to continue to develop new programs for it. So I don't know. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, I can tell how interested you are. <laughs> You're just <laughs> beaming uh, with fascination over this story. You know, it's it's the internet. All, all the browser, at, le- at least at this point, all the browser is for me is is a window onto <clears throat> all of the different sites that that work underneath it. Um, the only p- complaints I have about browsers are when I have to continuously update the component p- pieces of it, like Flash and mm-hmm. mm, Shockwave and all that stuff. But honestly, they've made that pretty much transparent to me, and all I have to do is click yes once or twice, and and then I'm good to go. But um, there hasn't been, a, as far as I'm concerned, since they installed tabs in all of the browsers, there's been no real innovation to the way I browse the web. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, it's just not. Yeah, I'm so, and I'm I'm a hardcore you know Google Chrome kind of guy. So I mean, I have all of the browsers installed just so that I can go through because the pain in the butt for web designers is trying to make a design that works right in every browser and every right. version of it, especially the people who are still using Internet Explorer 6, which just drive me mad. <laughs> Internet Explorer 6 is so different from every other browser in the way that it handles CSS and a couple of other things. And it's just a headache to try and make things compatible with it. <clears throat> so I hope people will upgrade, but I'm not really expecting it. Well, a lot of people get... I mean, isn't it kind of a forced upgrade when if you have Windows, anything that isn't XP, they- and you run up... They haven't announced yet. I suspect that whenever IE9, and this is just the beta, so obviously that won't be forced to anyone, but whenever the final version comes out, I suspect they're going to do it like they did Internet Explorer 8, and it just came up as an option during the the updates. It would come up and say, this is available, and do you want to install it? Mm -hmm. So we will see. It doesn't bother me one bit that it doesn't support XP. I mean, at some point, they have to draw the line and move forward. I know there's a lot of Vista haters out there, but, you know, 7's been out for a little while now. 
And, you know, mm -hmm. it's not like they're forcing you not to use XP. It's just that you've got to use a good browser and not mm -hmm. <laughs> explore. <No. laughs> maybe they're, maybe that is a bad choice for them because maybe that will cause more people to go away from Internet Explorer. I don't know. I don't know if that'll make any difference. Yeah. So I just get like, so IE9 is coming out and you mentioned before the show started, we, we've got a new beta of Google Chrome coming out. That's right. Google Chrome 6 uh, beta version just came out here August 11th. And um, one of the big things I guess they're saying is they added autofill to populate web forms. It aut automatically types in names, addresses, credit card information, and it's also faster. Mm -hmm. I thought it already had autofill, but I guess maybe just for passwords. <laughs> I was just going to say, like, really? It took them six versions of Chrome to install autofill? I think they're trying like, to catch up a... with Internet Explorer version 9. <laughs> yeah, like... There's been a Google, a Google widget as part of my Google toolbar that's done that for me for four years. And, <laughs> and now Google Chrome is just now building it in. Well, and do you know one thing that was kind of interesting? Do you, in Google Chrome, when you first launch it, by default, instead of taking to a home page, it takes you to this channel page where it shows you your last, you know, however many yeah. websites you've looked at and your most yep. frequently visited websites. Uh, that yep. was also a feature, you might remember, of uh, Google Toolbar for Internet Explorer. Yep. And mm -hmm. they removed that in the latest version. And I had really? a couple of customers who were very unhappy with that. They couldn't figure out where their nice homepage went. And I looked uh -huh. at it and looked up Google's help documentation online, and they said that that feature is no longer available in the Google toolbar. But if you'd like it, upgrade to Google Chrome, and you can mm -hmm. download it here. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, so, so that's the way it's going to work. You know, pull mm -hmm. you know, features from Internet Explorer toolbar and force people to go to Chrome. Right? And that worked, yeah. as a matter of fact. I had a couple of customers who were thrilled when I installed Chrome for them so that they could mm -hmm. have their you know usual homepage thing. It was that big of a deal to them. Wow. Well, I mean, I do like that uh, that feature. It's been on, I don't know how many versions of Safari it's been a part of, but it's it's my homepage on Safari now that I have a Mac. And uh, it's very super, super convenient. It shows me, uh, I mean, I have it set up to show us the last 12 uh, top sites, like our, our top 12 sites that we go to all the time. Mm -hmm, right. Or, or, or most recently, I'm not sure how the algorithm does it all, but, and then I can toggle it between top sites and I can talk and history. And so it'll, it'll show me either the top 12 or the last 12, that kind of thing. So it's pretty cool. Um, but again, so this type of thing, yeah, it makes it a little bit easier. Your homepage gets a little bit of a, of an update in something like this, but honestly, browsers are, or an afterthought, if they even qualify it as an afterthought, it's like, just just give me one that works. Yep. Um, I I think that's the problem. I think that's the problem. I think that's why I don't care about browser updates anymore. It's because all they're really doing is fixing shit that didn't work before, and and they're not actually innovating anything. And you know, it it's stuff that they if they just kind of centralized the code as you were talking about and made it a consistent standard as to how a browser is supposed to handle CSS, um, then... Well, and there's know, organizations that have tried to do that. The problem is that big guys like Microsoft don't think they need to, you know, follow the rules. I think they like to make up their own standards. Mm-hmm. And then, and no there's, one. you know, and there could be some competitive reasons for that because whose standards are you going to follow? Netscape, who has, you know, what, 3% of the market or something, or Internet Explorer that has, you know, what, like 60? I mean, it's just, right. what are you going to do? Uh, right. Well, and they have a financial incentive not to let go of their stranglehold on pre-installed software. Yeah, they do. On, <laughs> on every PC. So, yeah. One I thing get that... it. It's just, I, I'm bored. <laughs> I'm bored with browsers. I'm sorry. Well, I'll, I'll mention one more thing that might excite you a little bit, and then we'll move on. Uh, it right. says, Google 6 is also extending the synchronization of bookmarks and preferences from Chrome by letting users sync their Chrome extensions and data stored in the autofill feature, excluding credit card numbers, through their Google account. So it means that anything on your Google browser, if you set it up for the synchronization, your favorites, your autofill information, all of that stuff will synchronize into your Google account so that it will synchronize across multiple computers. So if I have mm. Google Chrome installed on my desktop computer or on my laptop computer, I've got the same favorites on each one. I've got the same, yeah, probably yeah. same browser history on both. They don't mention that, but I wouldn't be shocked. And mm -hmm. uh, and extensions on both. So it's the same yeah. browser no matter what computer you're sitting at. And that's something we had talked about on the show you know, months ago, saying that Google mm -hmm. ought to do that. 
because that's a yeah you know, that's one thing that I liked about Firefox is that there's an extension that allows you to do that you know it's synchronized favorites and um, called X marks for those interested and I I couldn't believe that Google being the the big company that they are and and everything linking to your Google account that they hadn't already done that so mm -hmm. so they're adding that into Google Chrome six. And it says that in an effort to expand beyond its 7% share of the worldwide browser market, Google is ramping up its build cycle for Chrome, trying to deliver stable Chrome releases to users every six weeks, twice as fast as the original pace. Holy crap. So, so we're going to be to like Google Chrome 18 pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Gee, many Christmas. Yeah. Not yeah, that every so... stable release will get its own major release number, but you know what I mean. Right. Yeah, I know what you mean. It, again, it's like you're releasing all these updates every six weeks. It's not, <laughs> I, I I don't know. It, it doesn't, I'm not a web programmer, so I don't know how fast things change, but it would seem to me that if you have to re-release your product every sixth week because of changes to the internet, uh, that's a lot of wasted time and effort due to a lack of standardization. Right. Well, and like, I'm sure they would argue some of those changes are bug fixes and security fixes and new features like this. It's not really just web standards, but. Oh, okay. But it's it's buggy software, or it's it's stuff that they screwed up by re-releasing re the last the last version too fast, right? <laughs> like if they just held on another six weeks, they could have cut their efforts in half. I don't know. It just feels like overkill in in the browser war type of thing, especially when I mean. Google Chrome is fighting to maintain its 7% <laughs> browser share. Right. Holy crap. Well, yeah, 7% yeah. is a lot of people, but you're right. It's, it is, yeah, it's, it's a lot of people. It's a lot of laptops it's or computers, but it's 7%. So uh, Wikipedia and has, um, I'm not sure where they're getting their information from here. Um, I'm not sure where they're getting the information from, but I'm sure it says in this article. But on the Wikipedia, the uh, web browser usage share as of July 2010 shows uh, Internet Explorer at 51%, Firefox at 31%, which is pretty shocking. I didn't think Firefox that was that shocking. high. Chrome yeah. at 8%, Safari at 5%, mm. and Opera at 2%. Huh. Just food for thought. Yeah, I wonder if that includes, like, I wonder what it looks like on the the mobile side, because honestly, that's where the growth is. Hmm. Not that it. I mean, if if you're gonna if you're going to invest money anywhere in your browser platform, I would think it would be on the on the mobile side these days. I know what you mean. Um, I I mean I know I have Opera on my iPhone in addition to the default Safari. Um, I've used it exactly twice, uh, but you know, cause Safari is just really, it's, it's integrated into the phone. So of course that's what I'm going to end up using most of the time. But, uh, yeah, I'd be interested to see what that looks like. Cause as far as I know, what does, um, what do all the droid phones use as their browser? I believe it is, I believe I, it is I, based I, on, um, what's the framework that they use for Safari and, uh, for Chrome? Hmm. Dan oh, would know it no off idea. top of his head. It's based on yeah. that, I believe, but I could be wrong. Oh, okay. But I, it's built in house uh, by Google, I believe. But it's, by Google. it's okay. I think it's on that framework. Hmm. Yeah, like so, iPhones. I mean, I guess it's kind of the same model as Microsoft's model, right? Like, put your browser on as many mobile phones as will as you can get your hands on, and that's the way to grow your share of of browsers. But to your point, like being able to synchronize my Google Chrome bookmarks history autofill information on the web at my home PC with uh, my phone's browser, which I can kind of do as an Apple user, both at home and on my phone. Um, that's that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's like, very cool. Yeah, it's basically taking every all your preferences and putting them in your pocket. It's interesting oh. to look here. I'll see if I can bring this up on the screen. I don't know how well that'll come out, but this is also from Wikipedia, and it shows usage share of browsers uh, across the years, going from 2005 to present. So it's only over five years. 
And mm -hmm. uh, it shows Internet Explorer up at around 90% in 2005, dropping down to their Oof. current around you know, 50 or 60% as of 2010. And it, you can just see that black line at the top. That's just Internet Explorer's market share dropping. And meanwhile, you can see the red line near the bottom going up, and that's Firefox going from, yeah, what, 2% or 3% in 2005 over the last five years, going up to 30%, which is pretty impressive. And then mm -hmm. Safari had a little bit of a, a little bit of an increase through 2007 and then dropped. I don't know what the story was there. And uh, the, the yeah. green line, though, you can see is just growing faster than any other. And that's, that's Chrome down there, just coming out mm -hmm. mid-2008. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. It looks like there was a swap between Safari users in mid-2007 and Opera users in, in mid-2007. It does look like that. I wonder why. Huh. Interesting. I wonder, I wonder if, if Opera when, made a big Mac release big, or something. Big, exactly. Yeah. I bet that's what happened. I like graphs. Graph fun. See, this <laughs> See, graph makes browser wars interesting. <laughs> See, you were falling asleep before, and now that I give you some numbers, you can... <laughs> yeah. No, I like it. That's, it's pretty telling. It's, it's pretty telling. But, uh, you know, so the things that have actually innovated and, and made the web faster and prettier, Firefox and Chrome... And to some lesser extent, Safari and, and Opera, and they're they just keep eating at the lion's share of of Internet Explorer's boring, stupid, uh, 404 HTTP source not found, whatever the heck the blue screen of death equivalent is for Internet Explorer. Um, they suck, and I'm tired of them. That's why I moved to Mac. Is Google Chrome available for Mac? Last I checked, no, but I, was, I don't know if it is There might now. be a beta or something available. Yeah, it says for XP, Vista, and 7. They still support XP. Of course they do. All no. right, well, moving on. Enough with the browser wars. Yeah. I know I caught your interest now, but we'll just have to keep an eye on that <laughs> and see. And we'll see what other new features IE9 brings out. We haven't heard a whole lot about it yet, so we shall see. Right. Um, Speaking of Google, how about uh, Google Wave? I, I, were you a big user of Google Wave, Ryan? I'm on there every day, and um, I used it twice, which I think is two hundred percent more than most people. <laughs> yeah, I think that's about accurate. Uh, that's about how much I use it. I signed up for it, and I went in, and I saw that you had signed up for it, and <laughs> yeah. I think that was the extent of the use. <laughs> and apparently, yeah. that was a widespread problem. Uh, so Google has decide to kill, uh, decided to kill Google Wave. And for those who didn't yeah. know, Google Wave was supposed to be this new social media system that the way people were going to communicate and plan and share documents and do all sorts of other things with. Yeah, I think so. I would say that it's dead for now, but I would bet my bottom dollar that it's not gone for good. It's not really dead. They just put it in cryostasis. <laughs> uh, they it. When Are you, you think it was just the, too like, soon for that kind of a system or too much competition? Too soon, too much competition, too much other stuff going on at the time, too much noise in the in the web or, or whatever you want to call it. But you know, when I watched the tutorials, the like the video demonstrations of what the wave system was meant to do and, and how it could be used, I was like, oh wow, this is really cool. I can't wait until I have, you know, 80, 90, 100 of my friends and coworkers and whatever using this thing but it won't be useful until then right not enough adoption um, exactly and the so other the thing is they got off kind of on the wrong foot at the beginning if you remember they set privacy settings for existing google accounts yeah a little open and i don't know how much effect that had on the early adopters but i know that there were some privacy people that were a little upset over that right right i don't i don't know to me, it was a great platform and it's still a great idea to have all of that stuff. I mean, you, you, one of the reasons you like your Palm Pre is because it consolidates all of your notifications, all your text messages, all your updates for a contact all in one place, right? right. That's basically what Wave was meant to do. And like I said, it, it's going to be awesome when it has large scale adoption and you know, you're not just writing to your other friend that you can write to. Uh, 19 other different ways and communicate with all the time. But I just don't think they got enough critical mass behind it when they launched it. And uh, I, I think it caused them to give up a little bit for now. 
But I and think it'll be back. What they have announced is that it's going open source. So it's possible that someone will pick it up and keep it running. Uh, they haven't closed down the website yet, and I don't know if they will. But it's just not going to be further developed in Google. Um, and they said that elements of it may be used in other Google applications in the future. Right, so, right. Which is kind of what I, you're... It yeah. My... It was interesting to me that, like, basically all it did was consolidate all of your all of your stuff that you already had on Google. And then if you wanted to integrate things like Twitter and um, Facebook. whatever, your Hotmail account, Yahoo, Facebook, MySpace, it, if you wanted to integrate all that stuff, you could. Um, so it was interesting to me that they still chose to make Google Wave invitation only, just like they originally did with Gmail. Hmm. Like you, you had to get was. invited to to get into Wave, um, and that so and they kind of relied on that invitation process. But honestly, I was too lazy to invite people to Gmail, let alone <laughs> lazy. You know, it's not really up for me to to tell people, "Hey, come join Google Wave. It's kind of cool." Yeah, uh, the product should sell itself, and then people should come to it, and they should market it to to everyone. I'm not um, sure they did too much in the way of marketing. I mean, I don't know that it ever had exactly. a place on the Google homepage or, you know, I'm, right. it, maybe it did and I missed it, but I'm not aware of it. Yeah, I think there was a link at the bottom under the search field that said, you know, try Google Wave today oh, or there? whatever. Or, See, yeah, they usually do that I, when they have yeah. new products launch, and I, I don't remember right. seeing that, but that doesn't mean it wasn't there. Right. They did it for Wave. They did it for Buzz. And, and actually, I think Buzz came after Wave, and Buzz was the idea of creating Buzz around things like Wave, or, or like to advertise that that Wave was there and um, could do all of the things that Buzz was telling you about anyway, <laughs> and it could show it to you in one in one frame. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So again, I think there's definitely value in what they were trying to do with it. I just don't think they executed it well or at the right time. They didn't market it. I had to go do my own research to find out how the thing gets used and why it's useful um, as opposed to tell, having Google tell me how to do it. So it was interesting. Well, I'm not shocked to see it go. I was kind of surprised that it went so fast, but I'm not shocked to see it go. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it's not really going. It'll be open source, so I suspect it'll live for a while. Um, okay, moving on. So... Tell me about Apple iTunes. All right. So um, everybody might remember that uh, roughly maybe a year ago, uh, Google, or sorry, Apple acquired uh, the streaming music service Lala. And there was speculation then that has recently been reheated uh, that that meant Google, uh, Apple was going to take iTunes uh, into the cloud. Um, and so I guess the reheated version of this speculation is the fact that, uh, Google, Apple, damn it. I keep saying Google, <laughs> Apple is hiring a user interface engineer, um, that according to the job description will be responsible for implementing interactive, rich media projects within the iTunes group. And then, uh, based on the technology review article here. Um, the job description proceeds to list familiarity with a number of web technologies as qualifications. So what this would mean is uh, you can carry around your entire iTunes library in your pocket on an iPhone or an iPod or an iPad, or if you don't have one, any of those three devices, you can still buy, purchase, stream, and store iTunes music in the cloud from any other Wi-Fi or 3G enabled device, which holy crap opens up a whole new, you know, it basically jailbreaks iTunes, um, but keeps the revenue in Apple's pocket if it works. Hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's basically your own private paid for YouTube uh, that you can access from anywhere, but for music and video, That's I assume. Interesting. I, I I wasn't familiar with this. I've never used Lala, and I've never looked at it before. I just tried to go to their website, and of course, it says they're closed. But uh, <laughs> be back in fifteen minutes. <laughs> the Lala service has been discontinued as of May thirty first. 
Okay. Lala members, click here for more information on applicable credits or refunds. So apparently, um, Apple will give you a refund in the form of an iTunes store credit. No, oh, great. <laughs> I guess that <laughs> sure. counts. It's better I'm sure the Lala of people were really happy with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so you know, this comes at a time, or the speculation at least is coming at a time when people are talking about net neutrality and, and the ability for people like Verizon broadband providers to, you know, prioritize or deprioritize internet traffic based on the user it's going to and the size of the of the transmission. So it's kind of a timely example of like just imagine. I don't know. iTunes probably has 80% of the online purchased music market as it is. Mm -hmm. um, and just imagine uh, the rest of your mobile devices around the world getting access to that same uh, store of music, but from anywhere and having to transmit it fresh every time. Yeah. Uh, man, I, I hope to God they come up with a... 98% improved compression scheme to, to make that work. <laughs> Otherwise, well, and, you know, one thing that Apple has always done is they've had the, you know, Apple things work with Apple things, you know, exactly. mentality, and that's it. Nothing else. Whenever the Palm right. Pre came out, one of their big claims was that it would sync with Apple iTunes. And then a month <laughs> later, Apple changed right. it so that it wouldn't. And then Palm Pre changed it so it would. And it went back and forth for like a year. And then Palm Pre said, all right, we no longer sync with Apple. <laughs> just, oh, geez. <laughs> so uh, actually, they took it to court, if I remember correctly, or uh, at least to the USB standards board. And the USB standards said, yeah, that's okay that they can do that. And Palm Pre is not allowed to pretend like it's an Apple device in order to <laughs> sneak by compatibility. So anyhow, if I remember correctly, you might have to look that up to confirm, but it was very interesting. My point being that one thing that Apple has going for it is that if you have your entire music library in Apple iTunes, if you want to sync that to a device, you're going to get an Apple device. They almost have yep. you locked into that. You have to buy Apple hardware yep. or you're going to buy all your songs again. Right. So if they it open this up too much, they're going to might lose some market share on their devices. Yeah, so it is a it is a walled garden. Um, they might lose. So the trick would be that other devices would have to do iTunes at least as well or better than the Apple devices that are already out there in order for them to lose market share. They may have trouble continuing to grow market share, but honestly, like the the major appeal, at least. From, from my perspective, uh, the major appeal of buying an Apple device is the device itself and the interface itself. It doesn't have anything to do with the fact that, oh, uh, geez, I have to have an iPod to run my iTunes. Well, no, I wanted an iPod anyway. Like, I, even if iPods had been just another MP3 player, it still was the coolest MP3 player out there. And it's the one I would have gone for. Yeah, so you mean I, even even if you could sync your iTunes with any yes, device, you'd still want with any iPod. device. I'd still want the iPod, and I think that's the gamble that Apple is is making. They're putting their design dollars where their mouth is, and saying, you know what, well, we have a the the world's greatest uh, iTunes or, or greatest online music library that's accessible from anywhere, and we believe enough in our design that we're not going to lose product share based on opening up our walled garden to other devices. And it, it is a big gamble for them to take, but I think it's a good one. And I think they're probably doing it to uh, encourage wh whoever, whatever recording labels or, or music studios are not already on <laughs> iTunes to come in and say, look, now anybody, anywhere, no matter what device they have, uh, can get your music. Just I think share. there's a couple of things. I think that may be part of it. I think part of it may be, I don't think they're going to get too many converts that are using other devices to come into Apple as a result of this. But um, but I think the bigger thing is that um, it's going to prevent someone else from jumping in and doing the same kind of thing. They're going to, they're, they're jumping ahead of competition. So you couldn't have a competing service jump in now with, you know, uh, across all platforms, mp3 and easily compete with uh with apple they right you know, you know what i mean they're cutting off one yeah. big source of competition i think yeah well and then if they open this up to everybody no matter what your device 
in theory, they could also drop the price of of every song uh, <laughs> and, yeah, right. and lock out even more competition. And um, uh, yeah, I don't know. In theory, they they could. I think yeah, it's actually a pretty good observation. It's it's very kind of anti-competitive, I suppose. Even though it looks like they're getting, yeah. I don't know. It'd be interesting to see how how it plays out. And again, this is all speculation. Um, but to see Apple open up a an interface like iTunes to things that don't have the Apple logo on it, um, it will be interesting. It will be interesting. And holy crap, are our pipes going to explode <laughs> if it if it works without without a new compression scheme? Our pipes are going to explode. Um, so we'll see. All right. Well, lots of things for us to keep an eye on. Um, anything else we wanted to mention? Uh, I'll mention that the next time we'll probably, or one of the next couple of shows, we'll probably get into a uh, comparison of the Nissan Leaf and the Chevy Volt. Uh, right on. For for those of you that don't know or don't care, uh, <laughs> the the Leaf and the Volt, basically the two new electric vehicles that are coming out. Uh, the first from Nissan, the second from Chevy uh, in the balance of this year. Uh, a friend of mine out here in the area has already pre-ordered their Nissan Leaf. Um, and nobody has pre-ordered a Chevy Volt yet, I don't think, because they're <laughs> almost fifty freaking thousand dollars And uh, they're counting on the government to fund $8,000 of that for people to still want to buy them. So more to come on uh, the Leaf and the Volt. Just a quick preview on what one of the things we'll touch base on. Uh, hopefully right before they officially launch either one of those vehicles. Good. I'm looking forward to that. I want to find out more about them. And uh, I, I like, you know me, I'm, I'm, I'm into the green stuff. I, I have a hybrid and I'm, I like the idea of the electric car. I think it makes sense because then you can get the power from anywhere. I mean, right now, yep. sure. You know, the majority is still from coal, but you know what I mean? It's, it opens up your right. options. Then you can get yep. it from solar. You can get it from alternative energy. Yes. So I think it's a step in the right direction. Right. Right now we're shackled to fossil fuels by default because that's what, what our infrastructure is based on. And we also have this infrastructure to power our homes that's based on mu multiple sources of fuel, coal being the biggest one. But, uh, you know, if you can power your car the same way you power your home, then you have all those choices. It's a it's an important first step. I'll put it and that way. The, I've discussed it with a couple of people, and of course, one of the biggest objections to the electric car is that it only goes so far. You know, a hundred miles or two hundred miles or whatever per charge. But right. you know, the reality of it is that ninety nine percent of your driving in a day is less than a hundred or two hundred miles. Most yep. people are commuting, you know, five, ten, fifteen. All right, maybe twenty, thirty miles if you're really out right. in the boonies. Right, but. And that's what they're designing this for, I think, is that the daily commute. I mean, it's not really for mm -hmm. the traveling across the country car. For right. that, you will need a different vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> or or you just need a vehicle like the the Leaf uh, that will tell you where the next charging station is. Or you need an electric vehicle that charges on any regular 110 volt uh, well, thing. But even then, you're limit, you know, it takes a long time to charge. It's not like you plug it in for 20 minutes right and you're now. good to go. Right no, now. That's true. That's Right now it does. It used to and take honestly, a long time. And honestly, even when I'm traveling a lot, how often do you travel more than 200 miles a day? Right. You know, okay. I mean, that's really only a, even a, 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 I'm thinking of road trips I've taken exactly. recently. And generally I'm spending the night within 200 miles. Right. It's two, maybe three times a year when the family piles into the, into the electric SUV and you're going to want to, <laughs> you're going to want a range of more than 200 miles at a time to make it to grandma's house before Thanksgiving. Right. Like, that is the only thing right now that the technology hasn't caught up with, but it will. I mean, we used to have to get out of the car and turn a crank on the <laughs> end of the motor to get it started, people. Right. I mean, come on. And that was only – that was less than 100 years ago. Yeah. I think. Right. Yes. So, yeah, that's that's a good point. I mean, this is first gen. Yeah. yeah. First, first generation stuff's 100, 200 miles. So in, you know, by the time your daughter's driving, it's going to be, you know, 500, you know, a thousand miles on a charge. No problem. By the time my daughter's driving, I am counting on the scientists to have perfected teleportation, actually. Oh, oh, okay. that's the, <laughs> that <laughs> that's way she I'm doesn't have to drive. That's <laughs> yep. She doesn't have to drive. She might end up with her head on backwards, but she wouldn't have to drive. 
Yeah. All right. Well, I look forward to more, more to discussion on that stuff in our next episode. We'll probably talk about that a little bit more next time. Uh, and that's going to be Sunday, September 19th at uh, 12 noon is what our tentative date is. Uh, keep an eye on techguy.tv for that. Uh, we have the, the next date uh, on there. And you're welcome to jump in then and join the chat room and uh, and talk to us live through there. Watch us live while we're trying to record this. Uh, that is always fun. And we're hoping to to hit that date. So so pencil that in on your calendar and keep an eye on techguy.tv for, for more information. All right. Ready, Roo. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you being with us. No problem. It was good. We'll talk soon. All right. Have a good one. She might burp. Oh. <laughs> she might burp. Say, hi, Uncle Mike. <laughs> hi, Uncle Mike. Hi, Kate. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a cutie.